and uh, the caption so I don't forget. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, as you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I know we have people from all over Connecticut, probably all over the country. So just let us know where you're tuning in from. That, that'd be really great to know. Um, and we'll get started in a few seconds. Don't see any any conversation in the chat, or if you don't want to tell us where you're tuning in from, uh, you know what brought you here today? Um, what's your? Oh, there we go, Michigan, Maine. Uh, what are your favorite books by these aw two awesome writers? Um, you could tell us that too. Favorite characters, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll go ahead and get started with my introduction. Hi, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator here at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. Thank you so much for joining us for this virtual program for Don't Fear the Reaper by Stephen Graham Jones and All the Sinners Bleed by S.A. Cosby. First, I want to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are very happy to honor his memory with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. If you're not a member, please consider uh, becoming a member. It's a great way to support the museum um, and all the work that we do. Um, all members receive free admission to our author programs, the house and museum, year-on discounts in the store and cafe, and much more. Uh, please visit our website for more information or uh, just drop me a line in the chat and I can uh, send you all that info. Um, now on to our guests. Our first author, Stephen Graham Jones, is the New York Times bestselling author of nearly 30 novels, um, as well as novellas and comics. He is the winner of uh, the Mark, he is a winner of the Mark Twain American Voice in Literature Award, um, as well as the Texas Institute of Letters Award for Fiction and the LA Times Ray Bradbury Prize. He's also been a um, NEA recipient and has been a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Award and World Fantasy Award. Our second author, S.A. Cosby, is an Anthony Award-winning writer from Southeastern Virginia. He is the best-selling author of Black Top Wasteland, a New York Times book review, uh, Editor's Choice, and Goodreads Choice Awards semifinalist, as well as Brotherhood of the Blade and My Darkest Prayer. Uh, so during the event, we encourage you to have a conversation with each other in the chat. Um, if you have a specific question um, for either of our writers this evening, uh, please post that directly into our Q&A section. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all for now. Um, so I will turn this over to Stephen and Sean. Please sit back and enjoy. All right. Thank you a lot for being here. It's cool. To yeah, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, we're looking forward to it. It's good seeing you again, man. Yeah, it's great seeing you, man. I, I guess yeah. we see each other since um, L.A., maybe. Yeah, the L.A. Town Book Festival. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Took one of my great, uh, one of my great pictures there. You made me look good. We, you helped me out with that. I appreciate it. <laughs> 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 I'm such a big dude that when I take pictures with like regular sized people, I, I look like this giant grizzly bear. And for those who haven't met Stephen, he's really tall, so it helped <laughs> balance it out. We had a lot of like positive space in the picture. So I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was a good green room. I remember Joe Lansdale was there. It was lots yeah. of people. Yeah. yeah, great food. I was like, I was so yeah. surprised. I was like, oh man, these are really good sandwiches. Cause it's yeah. not like that. Um, well, I guess I'll start by saying I, um, I just read, I just finished. I feel bad. I just finished it, but I just finished uh, Don't Fear the Reaper, uh, the follow-up to My Heart is a Chainsaw. Uh, love the titles too, by the way. And uh, I want to say just, man, it's an incredible piece of work. I am really impressed with the continuation of Jade's story. For those who maybe haven't read it, Jade Daniels is the main character of both. Um, she's a, a huge horror fan who knows all the tropes. Thank, uh, thank Randy from Scream, but smarter and uh, <laughs> a little, a little, a little more put together. Uh, and uh, she, uh, the story is about uh indian lake and uh proof rock and the people there and sort of the i love the sort of overall mythology that you create in these books with the legend of the serial killer and the final girl and using all the horror tropes that we grew up well i can't say for everybody but i grew up with in the 80s and sort mm -hmm. of 
reimagining them uh, through uh, an indigenous prism. So I just congratulations on it, man. It's a great book. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. And man, I, I guess I read All the Sinners Bleed. It seems like forever ago. It's been in my head and my heart for, for a while. Um, And you know, the, one of the most, one of the things I remember the very best from that book, I mean, aside from every single scene, of course, because your scenes <laughs> pop, um, is that um, the high school in Charon is in Charon, Virginia, that this, where, where All the Sinners Bleed is set, is named after two Confederate soldiers. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, what's it? What's it called? Jackson Lee or it's a uh, Jefferson Davis High, which is is based on. I went to uh, elementary school at Lee Jackson yeah. Elementary School, so that that was fun. Um. <laughs> no, it it stuck with me because um, my high school diploma is from a place called Robert E Lee High in Midland, Texas, and so I only went there for um, I guess a one fall semester in which I had, I think I had eighty four truancies, and there were only eighty two days in the in the semester. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how that happened. But um, every I, I hung out, I hung out in the parking lot a whole lot, and there were always those, there were always those stupid rebel flags. Like that was that was like the mascot. It felt like <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what they're doing in the, like this is it's, that's thirty years ago. You know, I don't know what they're doing these days. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> it's funny growing up in, in in some places, in especially in rural places in America, yeah. Uh, yeah. especially rural South or or some parts of the West. Mm -hmm. There is this uh. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but there is this 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 desire to relitigate, uh, yeah, the Civil War, and uh, right. you know, when I grew up, it was the War of Northern Aggression. I swear to God, that's what it was called. Yeah, but um, <laughs> oh, well, when, when I grew up, there was that Charlie Daniels song, <laughs> "The South's Gonna Rise Again," was playing all the time, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Are are they? Are they Billy? Are they really? You know, you and your brother too busy stealing Cadillac converters. But anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> uh. I wanted to ask you, uh, since the last time we saw each other, um, what was the like inspiration for the trilogy for the Indian Lake, which I and then it's going to be a trilogy with um, the Angel Indian Lake coming up soon? Um, because a lot of your stuff has been sort of a uh, sort of standalone ish. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my favorites is is uh, is, is oh, gosh, I messed the title up. The Werewolf, the Mongols. Mongols I love yeah. that book. Uh, and of course, you know, I, I can't tell anybody enough good things about um, the only good Indians, which is probably with Salem's Lot and in the hills and in the valleys probably one of my favorite horror stories so um what was the inspiration for doing a trilogy you know um the inspiration for doing a trilogy was that I wrote a standalone novel and I killed everybody by the end of it and then, <laughs> and then my editor Joe Monty he um he he kept on telling me, you know, what if what if not everybody was dead? And I kept saying, listen, I've been writing this book a long time. I, I built I built everybody to die. And mm -hmm. he, kept saying, he said, what if what if? And he Joe, he, my editor Joe at Saga, he's the kind of editor he never says do this or otherwise. Right. He just kind of says, um, you know, what what if he did it this way? And he he's a really smart, capable guy with a wonderful track record. So I really implicitly trust him. He's led me right every time he's led me anywhere, you know? And, mm -hmm. but this time I was like, he's probably making a mistake finally. I, I know everybody <laughs> dies. And he finally, he kept saying it long enough that I, I thought, you know, I'm just going to prove him wrong. So I opened up a side file and I uh, did a version of the ending where a few people lived and um, I gave it to him. And we both realized this is the real ending. And it, mm -hmm. he was right. He was right all along. You know, that's, that's the, that's like one of an editor's many, many talents is like seeing the beating heart at the middle of a big mess, you know? And, yeah. Uh, and, no, that's funny because my yeah. editor did the same thing. My yeah. first book with Flatiron, uh, I killed everybody in Black Child Wasteland. Like uh -huh. everybody dies in the first in the first draft. And I really was like hesitant to change that. And my editor was like, you know, maybe we could write it a different way or a more emotional ending. And I'm like, no, I'm trying to go for this Hamlet thing. And uh that's anyway. what I, was, I read Hamlet also, man. I said everybody's dead on the floor, man. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it was like fights of angels and all that. And um, and so then uh she uh she said, Well, look, do me a favor, write a scene where not everybody dies. Yeah. Just write the scene and see yeah. how it feels. Yeah. And then I realized the reason I killed everybody was that I um I wasn't ready to have the conversation. That is the ending of the current the book now, with the main character Bug and Black Child Wasteland is a former getaway driver who comes back to the criminal life. I didn't, I wasn't ready to have that conversation that Bug has with his wife, where he's very honest about, I'm a bad person, yeah. and I'm not a good father, and I'm not a good husband, and yeah. the thing that I'm good at 
is really terrible. And but through her encouragement and actually writing that ending, it sort of gave the whole book its point. The whole book, the whole point of that book is those last couple pages. Yeah. And so, like you said, great editors are able to find that. They really, they really are. And and so when I did that new ending for Chainsaw, then I realized, oh, Jade's story isn't done yet. This was Act One, like book in a trilogy. Book One is Act One, you know. And um, and I realized I can take this the full distance. And my my, my favorite thing about slashers in general, especially the cheapy ones from the eighties, from the golden the golden age, is when somebody does like a Friday the 13th and it's a one and done, but then it becomes a surprise hit. And so the studios and the market says there's got to be a sequel. We don't care if anything's left over. There's going to be a sequel. And so a, a new crew has to come in and sift through those ashes and find the most thin gossamer thread of narrative and pull it out and put a flip up on it and make it into a sequel and a franchise. And it, it's always like, so it, it feels like, I mean, it's a lot of retconning like in comic books, you know, yeah. but I love it. I just, I love that. I love the um like I don't know situational pressure of having to do a sequel when you never plan to do a sequel that that's that's the beauty of slasher sequels to me man. oh yeah I, I I mentioned you mentioned I love slash I love horror movies yeah. and you know if you watch the original Friday Thirteenth which yeah. you know trivia point Jason's not the killer spoiler alert he's yeah. not the killer in the original Friday Thirteenth but yeah. the people that came in made Friday Thirteenth Part Two which I snuck into our local theater to see I should not my I'll never forget my aunt dropped me off to see. Uh, Tarzan, the great Stoke, the legend of Tarzan, and like I snuck out of that into the next theater to see Friday the 13th and had nightmares for like a week. But, um, the thing that you said was so true is that they had to pull together some bit of lore, some legend, some sort of mythology to continue the story, and of course, that became the overriding mythology. And the thing I love about the Indian Lake series or trilogy is that it goes in places, um, especially Reaper, goes in places that are very familiar within the tropism of slasher films and, and books, but then it, it takes a wild left turn. Um, a lot of Jade's story is left, I don't say undone, that's not the word I wanna use. There's a lot more to her story at the end of Chainsaw and at the end of Reaper. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of the stuff that happens in Reaper is really, to me, you took a lot of big swings there. And I always like writers who take big swings who aren't afraid to uh, hit for the fences. Yeah. And so, um, where did this is a dumb question, so forgive me. But where did Jade come from? Like, I, I love her, just her personality. Mm -hmm. Man, where did Jade come from? Um, you know, I mean, I guess it's wimpy to say, but probably myself. You know, I'm not, I'm not as cool as her. I'm not as likable as her. You know, but um, <laughs> I, I'm really, really lucky that when in junior high she needed to find something to insulate herself with, insulate her life with. Um that she reached into that bargain bin and came out with Bay of Blood. Cause if she would have pulled out like a golf club, then I would have been screwed. Cause I'm not, I don't know nothing about golf. <laughs> you know? so, I'm so happy, but, um, but I didn't have to do research cause I know all this stuff. Um, but you know, I was, a I was like, like Jade, I always got sent home from in high school, my various high schools for my t-shirt choices. Cause they'd be, you know, wrong for school and distracting right. stuff, right? They wouldn't have sleeves or they'd have like artful holes that were more than the shirt and all that. And, um, <laughs> And um, I was a I was a night custodian too in high school for the biggest daycare in Texas, which is its own kind of horror story. And um, <laughs> and I was always the only um, Indian kid in whatever community I was in in Texas, you know, because Texas is always proud of having chased all the all the Indians out. And um, so I feel like I cobbled her together from a lot of pieces of myself, but also that at the time I was finishing Chainsaw, my own daughter was 17 and um, she's got a good attitude on her too. You know, she's, <laughs> and she's always got like three or four knives on her also. So <laughs> as you do. <laughs> yeah, but, and, um, and I'm real proud of her for that too. You know, she won't think twice about cutting somebody. Um, and, and so, yeah, like, like we all do. I just put, I put Jay together from pieces of myself, pieces of people close to me and all that stuff. But um. But you know, let me let me ask you a question. Um, after um, Black Top Wasteland and Razorblade Tears, those were both like adrenaline thrillers. Like, bam, they were moving, they were rushing, they were running. Thank you. Um, and then for all the sinners bleed, it's built more on the like scaffolding of a police procedural. What was it like to have to slow down and process clues instead of deal with another bad guy around the corner? You know, I wanted to do it. I did it on purpose because, uh, like you said, both Black Top and Razorblade are just you know, especially Blacktop, it's pedal to the metal. I wrote that book 
with like a chip on my shoulder. So it's, it's, I'm flying through it. And then with Razor Blade, I just, I amped up, you know, Razor Blade is about two fathers who lose their sons. Their sons are gay. The sons are murdered. The fathers basically weren't, weren't there for them. And so they try to avenge them. And so for that book, every scene just accelerates because the more they get into the mystery or the or whatever, the angrier they get. They're yeah. angry at themselves. They're angry at the people who killed their sons. And so it just, it's like a snowball rolling downhill. And when I sat down to do all the centers, I really wanted to do something more contemplative. You know, it's easier writing about outlaws, you know, mm -hmm. criminals, because they mm -hmm. don't have to follow any rules. They just, they ain't got to get caught. You know, that's the only rule. And um, I had a conversation with Walter Mosley once where he told me, he said, you know, everybody has morals until they're tested. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me for the longest time. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I'd like to see a character who's morally upright, who's, you know, smart, who's tough, but who is given pressure, just pressure on pressure on pressure. And mm -hmm. uh, so the, the more languid pace of all the centers, which I did that, like I said, on purpose, but also I did this thing where it's slow, it's slow. Oh, there's a dead body and it's slow and slow. And then like, oh, somebody got the face cut off. And then it's slow. So it was that rising and descending action. Um, I wanted the main character's name is Titus. He's the first black sheriff, in the small southern town. I wanted to put him under a lot of pressure. I wanted to see a character who doesn't break, whose morals are tested and who maybe has broken in the past but refuses to do so now. I, you know, there's an old quote, and I don't know who it is, but a knight whose armor is clean is a knight who's never been tested. And so that's what I wanted to do with Titus. I really want, you know, it's funny because my editor, it became a running joke through the book. She's like, is this poor man ever going to get any sleep? He's like, <laughs> but, you know, Titus is, like you said about Jade, Titus is a better, uh, a better in shape, uh, <laughs> smarter, maybe version of myself. I think uh, I was I was that kid in school who like I like to get in trouble. I like to have a smart mouth in school, but you know uh, I didn't like bullies. And uh, most of the fights I got in in school were either me defending myself against bullies or me defending other people. And that's something I still kind of you know anybody that follows me on Twitter will see that I, I still kind of do that. What I probably should shouldn't stop. Yeah. But um, so I wanted to take that kind of character and really just, you know, like somebody, a friend of mine said about good writing is putting a character in a tree and throwing rocks at them. And I wanted to do that with Titus. And uh, I'm pleasantly surprised that people have connected with the book the way they did. I was very nervous about that book. I was very nervous about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I mean, but you, you totally, it seems like you know that police procedural genre real well. Like, I think like, Connelly's Bosch is probably who we all go to for the step by step by step, you know. But um, mm -hmm. but just to, to tell you the truth, if Titus has a a closer cousin to me, it's probably um like um Robert Parker's Jesse Stone, you know. They, yeah. they, they feel very very they and it's really cool. They they're both like small town you know lawmen and they have all these. It's not just the case that gives them pressure. They have all this other stuff in their life that's that's pushing on them, you know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. With well, Titus, that's the thing I wanted to do. Like, it's funny because somebody asked me, they were like, you know, uh, Titus's father, him and his father have a really good relationship. Yeah. And they were like, that's not usually the way it goes in your books. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, but I've, <laughs> I've had a, a better relationship with my own father. And I thought it was cool to really show men of, of color, like just loving each other. You know, yeah. his dad loves him. You know, he loves his dad. Him and his brother you know, Titus, don't, him and his brother don't always get along, but they love each other. And I thought it was, it's important to show that. that and it's not, a, it's not a, a, a saccharine sort of thing. It's not, hopefully it's not over the, over the, over the top. No. It's just these, these, these men that love each other and care about each other. And, and that's what sustains him. I used to love this show. And I think you probably watched it too. I used to love the show Millennium oh, with, yeah. uh, with uh, uh, Lance Henriksen. Yeah, me too. And, uh, the thing about Millennium was it was about this guy who's a FBI profiler hunting serial killers. And the end of every episode, he'd come home to this beautiful crystalline yellow house. Like all the darkness of the previous episode fades away because he comes home to his mm -hmm. wife and his daughter in this really bright yellow house. And I wanted Titus's dad, Albert, and his brother Marquis to be his yellow house. Mm -hmm. So that when he comes back home from hunting this horrible, horrific serial killer who who's killing, you know, young children that you know that place is safe for him it's a safe harbor for him so um but yeah it was fun i grew, I grew up reading 
like horror and sci-fi and mystery. So I read like the Ed McBain 87 precinct novels. And like you said, Michael Connelly's Bosch series. Uh, I, I used to read uh, Robert Crace, the Elvis Cole books. So yeah. writing a true mystery with clues and stuff mm. was really hard. <laughs> it is. I've, I've done it. I've done it one time myself and it, it's hard because you got to know what's coming, you know, like I never know what's coming. And, but, you know, talking talk Elvis Cole, Elvis Cole has Joe Pike and, you know, like uh, Joe Pickett has Nate Romanowski and um, Easy Rollins has Mouse and, mm -hmm. and like Titus here, he has Marquis, you know, yeah. and, and it, it, it I, I think I said this somewhere else, but it feels like, um, I mean, I, well, I don't want to spoil the interview thing. It feels like this is built such that it could go further, you know, like there could be more and more. It, it's got those kind of, those kind of shoulders. You know, you like, know it's, it's funny you said it. Cause I, I usually write like standalones. I don't usually write the idea of a series. Like mm -hmm. I like, I like the closed circle story mm -hmm. beginning, middle end, mm -hmm. but people have reacted so well to Titus um i don't know man he might come back you know uh you know it's not really a spoiler but you know he he survives but he goes through some some stuff but the way people have connected with him it's funny because if you'd asked me a couple of years ago like who's my favorite character i would have said bug bug mm -hmm. is my favorite character he's, he's black top wasteland and mm -hmm. a lot of black top wasteland is what i was trying to say at the mm -hmm. time about masculinity and about living in a rural area and stuff like that but there's something about Titus, man, where he's just like, I would call Bug if I had to move a body. I mm -hmm. think I would call Titus if I just want to have a beer. Like, I feel like I could safely have a beer with Titus. Whereas yeah. you have a beer with Bug, you never know what's going to walk through the door. So uh, yeah. we may uh, we may see him again. We may see him again. He he won't leave me alone. So that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. keeps whispering. He, he so. could do, you could do a Stephen King Dark Tower thing and have them all, all your characters meet somewhere, you know? Oh man, I, the idea of the SA Coffee Shared Universe is definitely been floating around. I've been planting seeds yeah. here and there. It's, there's a character from my very first book uh, called My Darkest Prayer uh, mm -hmm. who makes a cameo in All the Sinners Bleed. I, and it's just yeah. very brief. He, yeah. He's there. And so I love it. And the thing I'm working on now has some elements of previous books. I, I love that. I love that story, like idea. So, yeah. Yeah. so I'll throw it back at you. So, um, you know, uh, the Indian Lake stuff had, well, I should say, Chainsaw has sort of this, I don't want to spoil anything, but it has this sort of undercurrent of a, of a, of a hint of supernatural elements. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a lot of your other stuff has really just very blatant, you know, mm -hmm. mongrels about werewolves, uh, mm -hmm. all, um, all, um, uh, Only Good Indians is, is, a, is a, a really powerful sort of folkloric tale about a supernatural revenge. And mm -hmm. so, have you ever considered that, like maybe moving, mentioning or bringing in some other characters from previous works in something that you're working on now or something in the future? Yeah, no, my next book I got planned is using some characters that are from a previous novel. And, you know, even in Only Good Indians, there's something that happens in Only Good Indians. It's mentioned near the end of the novel, and that is a main point in Mapping the Interior, this novella I did. And ever since a novel I did called Lead Feather back in 07, I've been kind of maintaining this family of... um yellowtails from the reservation and they, they always it seems like they always show up whether i want them to or not you know and I, I don't have any like big plans i don't think i'm not doing like an arc of this family line or anything it's just they're there and so they're going to be doing stuff you know and and so it's i mean it's not it's not quite as like cohesive as faulkner's yakapatawa county or anything like that you know it's just um mm. These are the, it's the same place so yeah it's gonna be some same people you know i can't yeah yeah i, I like that idea though like all my books take place in in virginia southeastern huh. virginia huh. um you know near the chesapeake bay the lowlands as some people huh. call it so it to me it just made sense that people would know people from the, yeah. like i know growing up in a small town i knew who like the sort of quote-unquote bad badasses were you knew who the tough guys were in huh. the next county over or, or whatever so to me it made sense that oh yeah people would mention you know, Skunk Mitchell in Blacktop Wasteland from Darkest Prayer, or that people may know, you know, Nathan Waymaker from Darkest Prayer and All the Sinners Bleed. And, and yeah. you know, those those characters sort of travel in the same circles. The same thing, I'm working on something now um, called King of Ashes. And uh, it's going to mention a, a very prominent criminal uh, from one of my first books. So, yeah, I, I like, it's not, I'm the same way. I'm, I'm not, I don't have this sort of overarching engineered plan I just like the idea of people knowing people, like mention yeah. people. I love um I love uh the, the idea of um name recognition. Like when you watch Star Wars and somebody says 
oh, they're getting Boba Fett and everybody freaks out. You know, it's like you don't have to even see what that character's done. Just yeah. the way it's the John Wick effect. The way people react to that character's name being mentioned is like, oh yeah, we we gotta go. I'm not staying if he's coming. So <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the danger of like trucking in like a character like if I truck in Denora from Good Indians into the background of a diner in a novel or something, then she's gonna be like a bowling ball on the trampoline. Everything's gonna roll towards her. So I gotta mm-hmm. be careful, you know. I gotta like mm-hmm. not probably not use Denora, I gotta use somebody else. It's not gonna oh, yeah. Form the landscape, you know. Oh yeah. yeah, like if you have a character that who's has a lot of charisma, or a character yeah. like I said who has a lot of that sort of gravitas, and like you said, it's that you know it's 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 the gravity well thing. It draws everybody to them. So you kind of gotta just yeah. sort of skirt over it, you know. Like I did that like with all centers. I don't name Nathan, but he's in the book. People yeah. know it's him when he you know there's a body that has to be removed. But yeah. Nathan's the type of character. If I let him start talking, he won't shut up. So it's like you gotta kind of he comes on stage, he makes his appearance, his cameo, and he leaves. Cause then it, it becomes a Nathan book. So <laughs> yeah, no, that's so easy to happen too, man. Um, you know, that King of Ashes, that's a great title. You you're really hooky with titles, you know. And um and I, I I was wondering while I was reading all the sinners bleed, was there ever a point in which this novel was called The Last Wolf? You know? <laughs> <laughs> that novel had three names. It was originally um black as sackcloth which is a, a a verse from the bible from revelations huh? or revelation and then um it was the the third wolf because that was the original title for the killer yeah. then i came around i didn't like any of those like they just didn't click and huh? i'm very superstitious yeah the title has to work it has to click huh? or i don't feel like i finished the book and um i was talking to a friend of mine who grew up in a uh, in a, a a Pentecostal church that did snake handling and stuff, and uh, she made a comment about you know uh, you know something about the snakes only bite the sinners, and, and I said, but we're all sinners, and she's like, yeah, so all the sinners believe, and I was like, oh, that's it, that's the book, and uh, so I had, I had to give her credit for that. So uh, if you're listening, uh, my friend uh, Nikki, that that's that <laughs> that's who came up with that. Uh, now I wanted to ask you something. So uh, was it last year or, or a couple of years ago? You had a comic book come out. I did, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that because I love comics and I read it and it was such a great uh, idea. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about that a yeah. little bit. Yeah, thanks, man. It's Earth Divers from IDW and it's um the, the volume one just came out, which is the rap. It's like the trade version of the first six issues. They're going to mm-hmm. publish the the trades by ARC. And, um, and yeah, it's... 2112 the earth has like the ecosphere has collapsed all the rich people are on rockets going to somewhere else to ruin leave all the um people who can't afford to get on the rockets back here on the ruined earth and these um four native people out in arizona in the southwest anyways they stumble onto a time travel cave and they decide that the way to save the world from where they are right now is to kill america to stop america from happening (laughs) and the way they decide to stop america from happening is to go back to 1492 and kill columbus and so one of them one of them who has a lot of languages because we're not sure what language columbus like spoke in day to day he could speak a lot of languages and write it write write a lot too um one of the one who can speak the most languages goes back and kind of you know magnum pi's his way onto the boat onto the nina pinta and santa maria (laughs) and um and and he um he his his mission is to kill Columbus and save save the world, you know. And it, it's so fun. Like that's complete wish fulfillment, you know, for, <laughs> for, for Indian person to be able to cut Columbus's throat, you know. Yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm all aboard for that. I'm like I'm all I'm all with that. Like I love that idea. I love the idea of going back in time and altering things. Like you know, go back and give uh give Nat Turner some machine guns. Just yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Hey, so so you you know horror inside out. I know yeah. from talking to you. Um, are we going to see a horror novel from you anytime? Anytime you think? I I you know I've been very lucky to write a few horror stories recently. I I, I just have a, a uh, an anthology just dropped the other day from Bleeding Edge, a uh, Bleeding uh, Bleeding Edge books uh, called uh, 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 The Horror on Main Street. It's a sort of a reinterpretation of Lovecraftian oh. myth, and I have a story in there. Uh, called the song of black flies about a blue singer who went missing uh down by the crossroads yeah. and her granddaughter uh come back home to try to uh find out what happened to her and also reopen her juke joint slash restaurant uh yeah. i got a story coming out with cemetery dance soon uh called blood uh uh blood red in the riding hood 
uh, about two characters trapped in a convenience store. I don't know if anybody else, again, if you're not from a small town or area that is very rural, there is very few scarier places on earth than a convenience store at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> especially if you don't had more than you should drink. Yeah. It's just especially in the winter time and it's cold and it's dark and you always got that one like parking light that's just blinking on and off, you know. It's like, and sometimes you go in there and the, the clerk can be a really cool person, and sometimes they they yeah. look like a zombie. So I, I wrote a story that's coming out in Cemetery Dance, and then I wrote uh what what blood have wrought for uh other I think we're in that together other uh, uh other fears uh oh, the anthology that's right no yeah yeah so I wrote that so I I would love to write a horror story a horror novel I grew up reading so much horror like mm. probably more than I should have um so I don't know man I, I I have an idea and uh it's just now it's finding the time to to put it to paper but I would love to write one I have a what I think is a pretty cool idea for a horror story I, mm. I just love horror novels and crime novels are really kissing cousins yeah a lot yeah because we use both of them use sort of human beings in their worst predic predicaments to show what people will do you know when you're tested when you're when you are out of options and so the thing that i mean the thing that i loved about all the good indians uh, only good indians and I've, read, I've read it twice mm -hmm. is your sort of unsentimentality with the main characters mm -hmm. uh that's a good way i think of putting it where <laughs> they you know i reading that book halfway through it i started wanting certain characters to survive mm -hmm. because I just felt bad for them. Like I really liked them. Some of the characters are great. Some of them aren't. And like um, you, you have no, uh, <laughs> you have no sense of sentimentality when it comes to those characters. There's a scene for anybody who's read the book. You know what I'm talking about? Where somebody's working on a motorcycle. And I remember I was in a coffee shop reading that, and I just out loud was like, "God damn!" And so <laughs> I know I scared the lady sitting next to me, but there's this sense in your books like in mongrels too that you i don't think you don't like your characters it's not that but you definitely put them on paths that they have to finish regardless mm -hmm. of what happens mm -hmm. and so i guess a question out of that rambling comment is do you feel like you owe your characters anything other than the story they're being told yeah you're right that i do i do love my characters but I love the story like 1% more, you know, I think, I think you got to, it's so, so yeah. that you, so you can feed your characters head first into that wood chipper, you know? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, But I do feel like I owe them. Yeah. Like if I, I do owe them, I, well, to, who I feel like I owe when I'm writing a novel is the reader really, because they're going to let this story into their head for six hours, for eight hours. And I've both got to um, take them, somewhere entertaining somewhere other than they are now i think that's like the one of the first reasons we read books is to go somewhere other than this room this chair this life whatever you know and to mm -hmm. just to be somewhere exciting where the stakes are are different um it, it, it's simply an escape but also i feel obligated to challenge them in some way if i can you know like they're they're mm -hmm. thinking preconceptions their morals something like that i want to like um like in in good indians there's that dog harley who has some really bad luck you know and i'm mm -hmm. And I, I, I did that sort of because I was making fun of the fact that people care more, more about dogs dying in novels than people, you know, mm -hmm. and that never makes sense to me. Like to me, people automatically matter more than a dog, you know, I'm not saying dogs mm -hmm. don't matter, but, right. but um, we all love our pets and, and stuff, but um, still, you, you know, you can, if your dog dies, you can bury it in the backyard. You know, if you mm -hmm. kill somebody down the street, you can't bury them in your backyard or you might get in yeah. trouble. You know? And they are not um, unless you want the police come yeah, so. <laughs> exactly. But um, but yeah, the first person I owe is the the reader, I guess. But I do feel obligated to the characters too, and I guess the obligation to the characters comes through in that I want to make their world as real as possible, so they have a place to be, a place to live. You know, a place where they don't have to pretend like this backdrop is real. A place mm -hmm. where they have to act less and they can be themselves more. Yeah, but, I think. It, you know, it was Uncle Stephen that said that it doesn't matter what you're talking about if the story isn't good. So your yeah. first, yeah. you know, your first responsibility is to the reader. You know, it's like, I want to talk about a lot of different things. If you were to read my books, can see it. I want to talk about class and racism and masculinity and 
and and uh, you know original biases and all that kind of stuff but nobody's gonna listen if the story doesn't crack if the story doesn't kick you know yeah. nobody wants a 300 page sermon and i definitely try not to do that yeah. um but i think for me i love my characters too but yeah you gotta you gotta put them through the ringer you know yeah. it's yeah. you know it, what, what, there is no if there's no conflict there's no story and so they've yeah. got to go through it. But for me, I always tell myself when I'm writing, especially if I'm putting them through something really gnarly, uh -huh. it's like, they can take it. They, they can take it. They can, yeah. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're built for this. You know, it's like, and so you kind of you, yeah. you absorb yourself or guilt because it's like, no, 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 he'll be okay. He's <laughs> fine. It's like when you see one of your friends get in a bar fight and they're just getting their ass whooped. They're like, no, 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 don't, don't get involved. He's good. He got it. He's like, come on, come on. You got this. Turn it. It's like, you know, you kind of do that with characters. Like, I, yeah. I believe in you so you can get through this. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, like, sometimes you have to, like, squash a character who doesn't deserve it, who is a totally good person. And when you, like, thump them off the playing board, that launches the reader into a space where they suddenly aren't safe, you know? And that that unsafe space that they're in, is a that's when you've got them. If you can get them, like, free-floating out there, they're, they're going to grab onto anything they can. And so whatever narrative thread you throw them, they're going to grab onto it. And that's when you've got them, you know? There's a there's a scene, and I'm not going to give it away for anybody who hasn't read the book, but there's a scene to this day in Blacktop Wasteland that is emblematic of that that I get emails about. Yeah. To, to now, people hate it. But it's like, you got to do it, like you said, because I want you to realize that this is a dangerous world. Mm -hmm. You know, like Blacktop Wasteland is about outlaws and, and getaway drivers and heists. And that's, I was determined... I didn't want to fall into that myth of the uh, the honorable outlaw. You know what I'm saying? You know, I remember listening to uh, Charles S. Dutton, who's an actor, talk about when he was a kid, he idolized Billy the Kid and Jesse James, right? And then you grow up and you read actual historical stuff about those guys, and they were terrible people. You know, Billy the Kid, you know, he was killed by 27 men, and 15 of them were, were black cowboys, you yeah. know? And so I, I've always had this sort of war in myself of enjoying the outlaws the idea ideology but also wanting to be honest about it you yeah. know destroying that yeah. myth of it yeah you know? no i totally agree like like a really good like illustration of that is um reservoir dogs like we're kind of on the side of these jewel thieves until that torture scene then we're like wait wait this is getting serious you know mm -hmm. and then that's mm -hmm. but that's when it goes into a good space i think you know yeah. Oh yeah, when it challenges you because yeah. it, and a good book or a good movie does that. It mm -hmm. challenges you. you like this character. Have you fallen in love with this character? Okay, I'm gonna show you who they really are. Yeah. I, I, I'll tell you, it's funny. I have a story about that. So every Mother's Day, on uh, I post on social media a scene from the movie 310 to Yuma, one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. uh, Russell Crowe, Christian Bale. Mm -hmm. and there's a scene where a deputy is saying horrible stuff about Russell Crowe's mother and yeah. Russell Crowe's outlaw. And he kills the deputy. And before he kills the deputy, he like whispers in his ear. He's like, you know, Byron, I always liked you, but you never knew when to shut up. He's like, even bad men love their mamas. And he, he kills him. And I posted it one time and I said, you know, Bug, the character from Blacktop Wasteland, would agree with that. So many people came into my thread like, Bug is not a bad man. Don't say that. And I'm like, ma'am, sir. Have you read the book? He kills like nine people. Like, like, like he runs people down in his car. He beats people up with wrenches. There's a scene where he slams a dude's hand in a car door repeatedly. He's not a good person. Yeah. But you know, same with the uh, the characters in Only Good Indians. It's a testament to your writing ability that I cared about these guys who really a couple of them aren't good guys. You know, a couple yeah. of them are, but a couple of them aren't. And yeah. the fact that you are able to make someone care about a not so good character at, at the same time this kind of good character gets taken off the board that's that's what you i think that's what you aim for when you're writing yeah and you know it comes back i know we keep coming back to stephen king i guess because he's at the center of everything but he said <laughs> nobody cares about your story if the characters in it aren't real you know and um and that that's that's always like my guiding beacon when i'm writing you know i know that I can think of all kinds of like cool spaceship stuff and everything, but who cares about that? What matters is if it's a real person at that steering wheel, or I don't know if you drive a spaceship with a steering wheel. Whatever you drive it. <laughs> I, I like to tell people, I've had people ask me this question. Um, like, they're like, Hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a, a cisgender white guy. What can I write about now? Like what can, what am I allowed to write about? You can write about anything you want. You can write about anything you want. You just have to be willing to do the work 
to make the characters characters and not caricatures. Mm-hmm. And you have to be willing to take the lumps because not everybody's going to like it. You know, yeah. I wrote a book called Raised by Tears, which has a, the early part of that book is difficult. It's a lot of homophobia, a lot of narrow mindedness, you know, and anybody that reads the book understands that you got to get through that to get to the point where these gentlemen are enlightened, where they learn. But you're not required to like that book. And, and I'm not required to make you like that book. But mm-hmm. I know that I did the work as best as I could to present a real authentic portrayal of all the characters in that book, especially the characters that are different from my experience. Yeah. And so, you know, I think if you don't do that work, regardless of what you're writing about, whether you're writing about characters within your experience or not, people aren't going to connect with it. You know, that's the thing. I, I firmly believe, you know, there are only a couple plots. You know, there are only a couple of plots in writing and fiction and, and, and stuff. It's the characters that make the difference. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I really believe that. I think once people care about those characters, you know, you can take a fairly pedestrian plot and mm-hmm. make it really sing because yeah. people care what happened to those folks. Yeah, you've got to get the reader invested in the the outcome for that character. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're rooting for or against as long as they're rooting. That's the important part, I think, you know. Yeah. Oh no, definitely, definitely. I think you know, like I tell people, oh, you don't gotta like the characters, but I, but you finish the book, so mm-hmm. yeah, for sure, for sure, and, and not not just because the return period has already passed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. I wanted to ask you something while I got you. So, um, like you said, we're, I grew up reading horror books and and looking at horror movies and stuff like that. Do you remember the first like horror movie you ever saw? Yeah, it was The Howling, man. Yeah. Yeah, oh, we we'd moved to town for like 15 months or something. I don't know why we I don't know why we were living in town. It felt weird to have these houses around us because we'd always been a trailer out in the pasture, you know. But right. in the house we moved into still had HBO hooked up. And so Howling was on the show and I was must have been eleven or twelve, I guess. And and I read I watched Howling and right around that same moment in my life, I read Whitley Schreiber's werewolf novel Wolfen. And yeah, so yeah. like those two just successfully like um like, I don't know, like the end, end of Twilight when Jacob imprints on Bella's baby, which is kind of weird and wrong. <laughs> but, but I felt like I, I imprinted on werewolves and monsters and horror at that moment. <laughs> I think I feel more comfortable with you imprinting on werewolves than I felt on Jacob imprinting on that baby. That that was, <laughs> I feel way more comfortable with that. Um, So my first horror movie, because I read horror novels before I saw a horror movie. My, yeah. my aunt yeah. used to read horror novels and she would give me like, like old school horror, like her Stephen King, but also like Richard Matheson and uh 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 gosh, what's the guy's name? Oh Jesus. It was a bunch. She used to give me like all her old books. Yeah. Um, you know, John Ferris. She used to give me like yeah. her books and stuff like that. The first horror movie I ever saw, I was 10 years old. My mom and dad had separated, and like you, we lived out in a trailer in the middle of nowhere. Um, and my dad had moved into town. So he was staying like walking distance to this old. Uh, second run theater where you could go mm-hmm. see old movies for a dollar or mm-hmm. two dollars or whatever so mm-hmm. we, I was with him one weekend and uh, he was like what do you want to do I said I want to go see a movie so we go to this old <laughs> rundown theater and they were doing a double bill back to back of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween Wow! and uh, my dad was like which, which, which one you want to see I, I want to see both of them because I'd heard about them yeah. and so I go into Texas Chainsaw and I think this says something about the malleability of a young child's mind versus an adult because we were halfway through Texas Chainsaw. I remember my dad was like, I'm going to be in the lobby when this gets done. Come find me. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I remember watching that and then watching Halloween. And I love both of them. But there's something about, to this day, Halloween is my favorite horror movie. Huh. There's something about John Carpenter and his yeah. steadfast refusal to explain anything. Uh-huh. Like, you know, no, this is what's happening. Well, why does Michael do this? Why? No, I'm, I'm, we're not talking about that. This, yeah. You better run. It's like, this is what's going on. And yeah. I love the, yeah. the 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 guts it took to do that. You know, oh. to like, I'm not going to explain where the monster comes from. I'm not going to yeah. explain his powers. He's, yeah. It's not the exorcist. It isn't the devil. You know, yeah. it's just this crazy dude who will not absolutely stop. So yeah. that, that's imprinted on me as, as well. So oh, that, And it, the neat thing about that, that production to me is that um, like that, that guy who put on the mask and played Michael Myers, he was just a friend of John Carpenter's there was that point where um, he had to walk across the street and they were going to like have that Pantaglide, you know, thing in front of him and all, all. And, and he asked him, he asked, he asked John Carpenter, he said, what's my motivation? And John Carpenter said, your motivation is to go from here to here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I 
I love that. I love that. I love, I love Halloween. I, yeah. I, I just, I love, you know, the, 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 I love mythology and you can do mythology and horror and sci-fi and crime, but mm -hmm. just the, the, the overall lore of the story, you know, uh, uh, Donald Pleasance is Dr. Loomis and talking about, you know, uh, Michael Myers's eyes and just, it's so good and so creepy. And I love that sort of, um, you know, unapologetic storyteller. Yeah, you know? yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of the writers that I really love in horror and crime and other genres do that. They just, no, here's the story. You know, yeah. this is what it looked like. And so, like, you know, you like, I think stories lose their magic when we over explain them, you mm -hmm. know? Like, no, I totally agree. Yeah. Like, for instance, I, I like the movie uh, Solo. If it wasn't supposed to be a Star Wars movie, it'd been a really great sort of dystopian yeah. sci fi space <laughs> opera. I never needed to see the Kessel run, mm -hmm. you know? I never need, I just needed to know it happened. I mm -hmm. needed to see the way people reacted when yeah. Han Solo said, I made the Kessel run in seven parsecs. And people mm -hmm. are like, oh, you're lying. There's no way. I don't need to see that examined yeah. and explain to me. No, I, I love the myth of that. So do I. Like, I. like, so many horror stories and horror movies to me are ruined by explanation, you know? And it's so much scarier to not know. Like, like even what is it red dragon I, I love red dragon thomas harris at that time was writing really hot novels but there's a like 70 page segment where we go into francis dollarhide's um um backstory his grandma abusing him and all this stuff and we understand and that we come out of that understanding that francis dollarhide is another victim he's not necessarily a monster he's a victim who's been turned monstrous and so the story is a story of victims and it just to me loses its punch like hannibal lecter is so much more scary i guess until the is it the fifth novel where we learn yeah animal rising yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i did like you know there's a killer and all of a sudden it's bleed huh. and i do a little bit of sort of expository mm -hmm. but I, I kept it to a minimum for that reason you know i yeah. want you to see yeah this person went through some things mm -hmm. but it's much scarier to realize i don't know who this person is i don't know anything about them yeah. i don't know how much of that is true and yeah. so it, there's no reason no rhyme for why they're behaving the way they are um, yeah i think you know i think that really is yeah again i'm gonna say this before but i love the idea of myth making i love the idea yeah. of stories that if they aren't true they should be yeah. you know and how they interact with the character i totally agree and i think you had the like right light touch with the killer's like skeletal backstory and what it does is it it signals to me that we all kind of have some version of that backstory and any one of us could metastasize into this type of terrible monster, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that's scary, man. That's Oh terrible. yeah. I think that's much more intense, much more suspenseful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. I'm working on something new and uh, I was asking a friend, <laughs> I got a friend named Jordan Harper, who's a really mm -hmm. good writer, um, mm -hmm. writes crime novels set in, uh, in California. And um, he, uh, I was talking about his new book I'm working on. And I was like, man, I don't know. I don't know if it's suspenseful enough. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you feel that way because you see the whole story. You know, he says the reader's not gonna feel that way because I was telling him some some of the set pieces in it. He's like, oh, that's pretty suspenseful. So yeah. I guess my question is, when you write, do you see the whole story? Do you kind of have an idea where you're going? Or are you really just, just to see where the story takes us? Yeah, I'm just figuring out as I go. I never really know the next thing or the next thing. Um, sometimes I can see a dim shape on the horizon, like three pages away or something, and I can kind of aim at that. But like with Don't Fear the Reaper, I was probably two thirds of it where I thought, yeah, maybe this person will be the killer. I don't know. <laughs> I was gonna, it was gonna all be a surprise <laughs> to me, you know. But I think I think Omar's here. He's probably telling us it's Q and A time, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes, and we have a a, a few questions here. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of love. Um, and a lot of curiosity. Um, uh, let's start off with some love. Um, Daryl says, I want to thank you both for the stories you tell and ask a question. You both seamlessly incorporate the experiences of indigenous and black people in America in your books, showing glimpses of the impacts of American history on your characters. Is that a conscious decision on your parts or just a natural element of your process? Thanks again for deciding uh that writing was the path you'd both take um for me it's just it's natural it's like i got an attitude or i got an axe to grind and that axe is going to get ground in whatever i write you know i don't i don't go in with a checklist like i'm going to deal with this and come up against with that and cut the knees out from this i'm i'm just moving through the world but there's friction when you move through the world and it kind of gives you an attitude and um i can't help I, I guess i can't help doing it i don't know how not to do it you know 
Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, you know, for me too, like I, I'm a black man in the South and mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about that. And those stories are going to come out and they're not always nice. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I definitely want to incorporate my experiences in the story um, as well as the region, because I'm a proud uh, Southerner. So I like to talk about the good aspects of it, but like James Baldwin said about the United States, because I love the South, I reserve the right to criticize it. Um, and as far as writing goes, I tried a lot of other jobs. I was really terrible at all of them. So writing was sort of my default. So <laughs> awesome. Um, Patricia says, uh, razor, raz razor Blade Tears was so very powerful that I had trouble reading anything else for a week or so after finishing it. I think that both of you are such cathartic writers that I wonder how you are able to go on to the next book. How do you find your way into the next story when you have given so much energy into a book? I'll go first, I guess. Uh, for me, I just like still telling stories. I, I have dozens of stories that I, books I'll never write. I know I want time. And so for me, it's always a thing about focusing. Like, okay, I, I did this story. Let me focus on the next one. Oh, I'm, I'm like a, you know, like, like a kid, baby with butterflies sometimes. Like, oh, there's another one on right. I got to do, and it's like, sometimes it's harder to focus on the next one because I have so many stories I want to tell. Um, but I think the idea of catharsis is true. For me, finishing the book is cathartic. Once I finish it, I can take a deep breath. I've told that story. And now here's four or five other ones I want to tell. Yeah, no, it's exactly the same for me. Um, You know, I was listening to some country singer talk about, sitting on Galveston beach with Willie Nelson at night, you know, smoking various things. And, um, and they're at a campfire and Willie's got his old guitar with him. And he's just like picking out these amazing melodies that this other dude has never heard. And he finally asked him, he said, he said, have you been working on this for like the last two years? And Willie says, no, no, man, the melodies are just in the air. You just got to reach up and grab them. They're always there. And that's how I feel about the next novel, the next novel, the next novel. It's, it's always right there. Um, the only, you know, the way I know what I'm done with the novel because you can mess with the novel forever. It's never going to be exactly what you want it to be. But um, the way I know that I have to move on is when the next novel is climbing over the gate, you know? And um, and I know I know that I can't have both of those in the live area at once. And so I have to push the one I'm, I'm ostensibly done with ahead to the big print wheel. And then I start on the next one. And I just try to write fast enough that they don't crawl over the gate and eat me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um alex um says uh one of the things that i loved about the only good indians was the overwhelming sense of dread i was just creeped out and at one point i was telling a friend how scared i was and they asked what's happening i said actually all that's happening is a guy is fixing a ceiling fan <laughs> <laughs> how do you create dread from the ordinary and alex also asks uh, uh, a side question uh is there a horror movie you really admire for writing for the writing for the writing um yeah there's <laughs> one from this year actually nefarious nobody not enough people saw nefarious it's a demon possession movie and it mostly happens across the table, two people sitting across from each other, kind of in an interrogation room. And I was really impressed that you can carry a horror movie without like cats in the closet and that kind of stuff. It really did impress me. But as for the the dread, um, like dread works differently at the box office and on the page, you know, because on the page, the reader can control the pace. They can slow down if they feel things getting too tense and all. So you have to um, set up all these like these blinds, these fake outs to keep them on the ramp. Like you have to like both um, ratchet up the tension while you're also assuaging their fears. And then you can blindside them with something. And like that, the purpose of dread in a horror novel is to set them up for a spike of terror, you know? And it's so much fun to do. And but it takes a lot of work for sure. And it, I think it, it's, it's helped by the fact that, I mean, it, when I do pull it off, it's because I'm scared of everything, you know? So I'm just putting my own fears on the page, I think. Oh yeah, I think so. I think suspense is the same thing. Like that, there's this famous Hitchcock quote where he says, suspense is two men sitting at a table. And then the, the viewer knows there's a bomb under the table, but the two men don't. Mm -hmm. And that's suspense. And I think that's the same thing with Dread. You have to have information the reader has that the characters don't. Or you can parse out information that the reader puts together faster than the character does. Yeah. You know, there's mm -hmm. a scene in Raised by Tears where we know two characters are going back to a house that they have no business going back to. But the other character doesn't know it. 
So when he's trying to get in touch with him, he's trying to call him, the dread builds because we know they can't answer the phone. They did something stupid. You've got to go save them. But he doesn't know it. So he doesn't have that sense of urgency. And those two opposing forces creates the dread or creates the suspense. And yeah. But it is easier in movies, I think, to control it than it is in books. People yeah. can put the book down and walk away. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but when, when you're doing a comic book, it's kind of fun because you can surprise them with a the page turn, you know, like it's a big mm-hmm. story splash page or something. It's You can't do that in a prose fiction novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of comic books, uh, Rachel wants to know, uh, what comic books did you love when you were teenagers? And are there any that you're reading now that you particularly love? Oh, man. Um, I was a big early Punisher fan before he got co-opted. Um, I love the Punisher because I always felt like the Punisher is what Batman would become if he if Batman didn't have a conscience. Yeah. Um I love Batman. Uh, Batman's my one of my, my Batman's my favorite combo character. Um I was a big Spider-Man fan. Um I also used to read um this book. I don't think it's published anymore. Uh it was called Heavy Metal and it was a, a, a comic book of like really far out uh, sci-fi and, and alternative westerns probably should have been reading as a kid as a teenager a little bit of nudity but uh really interesting artists and stories in, the, in that magazine so yeah the, but the punisher and batman are my two favorite uh, comic book characters man when i was a teenager my first comic book I ever read was the secret wars a limited series those, those 12 in 1984 i guess it was it may have spilled over in 85 um my favorite character i tried to always hang on to in my high school years and junior high too was spider-man um i felt like he was like i felt like except for superpowers that was my story because i felt like i was always one person when i was out and another person when i was at home you know and it's hard to like reconcile your two selves you know and that was always the the hard part for peter parker you know <laughs> and, oh and what i'm reading now um i think the best comic i've read this year was um What's a guy's name? Ram B, I think. It's from Boom Studios called The Many Deaths of Layla Starr. I really, really like that a lot. I'll give a shout out to uh uh the minor threats. It's a it's a one-shot comic book put out by Patton Oswald and his co-writer, uh, about uh minor street level villains who have to join together to stop uh, a major hero from going on a rampage. Really good storyline, great artwork. So I just read that recently. Nice. Man, Patton Oswalt is everywhere lately. He's even the crow on Sandman, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and finally, let's 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 end on a on a possibility here. Um <laughs> Hillary says uh she's just really entertained listening to both of you. Um and that uh you, Stephen, have a have um skill to be uh you know to to have entertainment on the spot. Um, but that both of you are lightning in a bottle. Um, any possibility that you'll do a collaboration? Wow. Oh man. I, I'd love to if our schedules would ever oh, uh, come on, come come back. Yeah, we have very similar story sensibilities. And I think we both go pretty fast too. So we'd, yeah. we'd be a good like um pair of oxen to hitch to a story wagon. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we come from, I think, similar backgrounds. And so like uh when we got to meet in LA, got to talk, it was really cool, uh sort of uh comparing stories uh both real and imagined uh i'm trying to get out west man i want to come visit you guys out there so uh yeah maybe something we should definitely talk about (laughs) yeah maybe maybe a comic book with um two time travelers just going back in time killing colonizers and (laughs) yeah that'd be pretty good and slavery (laughs) (laughs) but not mark Twain, right not mark yeah i know right (laughs) awesome well thank you so much sean and steven this has been amazing um it's you know it's such a pleasure to have you back here with us man it was an honor to do this oh man thank you guys for having us thank you uh to mark twain house and, and thanks steven it's great talking to you again man always great man yeah we should do this every day man yeah it'd be great <laughs> <laughs> yes and thank you everyone in our audience for joining us please buy uh their books i put the links in the chat but you can find it on our website um or you can find it anywhere uh just buy those books um and read them uh thank you so much and have a great night all right bye-bye